this is rather more a, a philosophical lecture, just to push the limits of, of the endoscopic, uh, I would say, techniques, but it's not the correct name. But uh, my name is uh, João Flávio Nogueira. I am here in Brazil. Uh, the situation of COVID-19 in Brazil is not so good at this moment, but uh, we, will, we will win this battle, I I'm sure. And uh, these are the websites, ex especially the websites of the International Working Group on Endoscopic Ear Surgery, which I, I recommend for you to access. Why? Because in, in this website, you have a lot of, of, of things. First of all, you have a lot of YouTube channels that uh, from doctors all over the world, from Spain, from here, South America, from North America, from the Middle East, uh, from Asia. Uh, and these uh, YouTube channels, they have a lot of, of things, dissection movies, surgical movies, a lot of things. And, and this is my... Uh, my personal email, so feel free to, to ask questions if you want. Uh, I, I respond my emails, don't worry. Um, we as doctors, I always like to talk about history first because our specialty is a merge between two specialties. It's a merge between ear surgery, ear otology, which has always been the mother science of our specialty, and laryngology. Why? Because laryngology got uh, the mirrors, the, the capability, the light and the mirrors, and the capability to see inside cavities. Because in, before that, before we had the mirrors or before we had any instrument to look inside our cavities, we didn't know what, what was happening. We, we only have, uh, we, we could only guess. So uh, the Garcia mirror that was developed by the laryngology and then merged into the otology science created a science called, and a specialty called otolaryngology. Rhinology came later. Rhinology came just uh, after that. Uh, you see the old magazines, they all, they are like laryngology or journal of otology laryngology or laryngoscope, or, they, are, they don't have rhinology. But I always like to say that we are not surgeons of a tool, but rather we are surgeons of the ear. So if you use your eye, if you use a loop, if you use a microscope, or if you use an endoscope, or in the future, if you use a robot, you're doing ear surgery. It doesn't matter the instrument. And the idea here is to try to have the best possible instrument to the task we want to do in the best way possible for the patient. So the microscope is a very good tool. It's an excellent tool. We are already uh, uh, comfortable with the microscope, with the view of the microscope, uh, with the two hands, with the uh, magnification of the microscope. But as every instrument, including the robot or including the endoscope, the microscope, it has limitations. And what's the main limitation of the microscope, in my opinion, uh, when we do ear surgery? It's because we cannot bend the light. The microscope cannot see the corners. And sometimes we have to take out a lot of bone to destroy a lot of healthy tissue sometimes in order to access some regions that otherwise we could access using different types of instruments with a minimally invasive way. So when we talk about that, we have to talk about the endoscopes because the endoscopes are like the state of art of magnification that we have nowadays. So the history of endoscopes is also funny because uh, most of the doctors, they agree that this uh, doctor called Filippo Zini, he was a German doctor, but uh, he, has a, he had a, an Italian last name because his mother was, was German, but his father was Italian. And his father was killed in a duel. He was challenged in a duel uh, in the two centuries ago. And then he was killed and his mother was pregnant of him without a husband, so he went back to Germany to her parents' home in order to have the child and in order to follow the life. So he was born in Germany, and Filippo Zini, and he uh, was a doctor. And he, when he was like uh, 26 or 27 years old, he tried to develop an instrument to try to see the cavities of our body, especially the vagina and uh, especially the urethra of, of some patients. At the time, of course, he had a lot of resistance because this instrument had a candle. You had to light up the candle and then you had the smoke, of course, and then you had to put the instrument and then you had to put the, 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 the speculum 
inside the body of the patient. Uh, at the time, the finger was the best instrument to try to evaluate the patients. But he believed, Bozzini believed, that our eye would be one of the best instruments possible in order to see what was happening with the patients. So we had a lot of resistance, of course, but uh, the thing uh, uh, went through these uh, uh, limitations and this, uh, uh, all this try. Uh, Many doctors tried to kill this instrument, but of course the instrument prevailed. And then uh, we ha have used the endoscope for many, many years in many, many specialties, especially general surgery or gynecology or other types of specialties. And then came the microscope. The microscope came with the neurosurgeons and the ENTs to do uh, ear surgery. And then the microscope was adapted to rhinology as I told you before, rhinology is uh, the, the newest daughter of our specialty. And then uh, I am not that old, but I've seen my teachers perform uh, sinus surgery with the microscope. And I have to tell you, to do ethmoidectomy with the microscope is very, very fine. It's very nice because it's straight. You have the second hand with the section, it's very fast. But to do maxillary sinus surgery, or to do frontal sinus surgery is very difficult because you cannot bend the light. So you have to move the heads and to have different types of speculum for the maxillary sinus. It was, uh, was a crazy thing, but I've seen microscopic sinus surgery and sometimes it's, it's very nice. But then it evolved to a combined approach. You would do the surgery with the microscope at the beginning and then at the end, you would put the endoscope to see the maxillary sinus frontal sinus, the recesses that you have on this uh, nasal uh, cavity and paranasal sinus cavity. So it was a combined approach. And I'm not, uh, I'm not telling that this was well, like 50 years ago, it was 21 years ago. This was the combined approach. And guess what? If, if, you, if you PubMed, if you search into PubMed or Google Scholar, you will see that there are far less complications when we talk uh, of microscopic sinus surgery than when we compare to endoscopic sinus surgery. Far less, of course, there are more people do endoscopic sinus surgery. So uh, if more people do, more people can have complications. But if you think about there are less complications when we talk about microscopic this sinus tissue. Surgery. And then I had a teacher in America, uh, Professor David Kennedy. He is actually from, from Ireland. And uh, Professor David Kennedy was one of the pioneers of endoscopic sinus surgery. And it was interesting because at the last World Congress on Endoscopic Ear Surgery, he was in Boston uh, giving a lecture, a very nice lecture about the, the history of endoscopic sinus surgery. So it was funny because this is a video that uh, was uh, given by the American Academy of Otolaryngology to, to doctors and to patients. And at the video, he is a very good surgeon, Dr. Kennedy, but a terrible actor. So this video, of course, is, is an uh, insanation of, of orientation of patient of sinus surgery. And then at the end, the patient asked, ah, Dr. Kennedy, what, what are the complications I would expect in my sinus surgery? And then he said, okay, you can have a CSF leak and then you can have a meningitis and then you can die. Or I can go into your orbit and then I can blind you. Or uh, I can hit like the carotid artery and then you die. And then the patient, just like after he tells all those things, said, okay, let's do it. And then the patient goes to the hospital. There's a very funny movie. But of course, you had a, a, a timeline of evolution of endoscopic sinus surgery from the 1970s until today. And today, there are people that are starting to try to do robotic sinus surgery or anterior skull base surgery. So, uh, but now we're, we're going to talk about endoscopic ear surgery, not about endoscopic sinus surgery. And I, I always like to say that we are in the second era of endoscopic ear surgery. Why? Because the first era, which I, I think is the era of, of Dr. Tarabishi and Dr. Jean-Marc Thomasson from France, it was a, a very primitive, oh, Dennis Paul in America, it was a very primitive era because the endoscope's qualities and the camera quality, the electronics uh, uh, involved in this uh, thing were not so good. So the image quality was not so good. And then uh, of course you had the bleeding and other problems. And then this first era in the 1980s and the 1990s were more like a, a curiosity thing than a, a practical thing. 
But now we are in the second endoscopic ESRG era because we have now instruments, a very good cameras, HD cameras, 4K cameras, 8K cameras with different types of filters and different types of things. But of course, this is all about anatomy. It doesn't matter if you have the best cameras or the best endoscopes or the best microscopes, but if you don't do, if you don't understand the anatomy, the middle ear anatomy, it's not good. So endoscopic ear surgery has given, especially to me, a good knowledge or it facilitated to me to understand the middle ear anatomy. And when we talk about disease, inflammatory disease, I'm not talking about cochlear implants or other types of disease, but when we talk about inflammatory disease, which is the workhorse of our specialty, I'm talking about chronic otitis media or perforations or stapes or autosclerosis, whatever. When we talk about inflammatory conditions in the ear, the birthplace of these inflammatory conditions is not a mastoid. It's the middle ear. The disease always starts at the middle ear. It can be at the mastoid. A cholestatoma starts at the middle ear. It can be at the mastoid, but it doesn't start at the mastoid. I have seen just like one case of a congenital cholesteatoma that has started in the mastoid antrum. But if you have an acquired disease, it will never start by the mastoid. It starts at the middle ear. Perforation is in the middle ear. Uh, this chronic supratetra otitis media. You can have granulation tissue in the mastoid, but it starts in the middle ear by the perforation or the retraction or whatever. So to understand the middle ear anatomy is paramount for a safe and effective and successful surgery. If you don't understand the sinus tympani, the facial recess, if you don't understand that, if you just know, if you just want to drill the bone or the temporal bone or to do a mastoidectomy, it's not good. You can have good results, but it's not good because you're not understanding the disease. And to understand the, the disease for me is paramount to understand the treatment. If you understand the disease, you can understand better the treatment. So this is a left ear. I removed the, the malleus and I removed the incus. And then we have here the uh, internal carotid artery, station two region here. This is the tensor tympani muscle canal. And this is the supratubal recess. And look, the mucosa here is different from the mucosa from here. This uh, difference has a reason. A reason. Here at the station tube is more close to the nasal cavity. The nasal cavity, I always say, is the Disney world of bacteria. There are a lot of bacteria there, virus, whatever. And then the middle ear in a normal condition is sterile. You don't have bacteria, you don't have virus, you don't have fungus, you don't have anything at the middle ear. Why is it sterile? First, the first barrier is the eustachian tube, which is closed, it's not open. The eustachian tube is closed for like uh, 20, three hours and 55 minutes during the day. It's a virtual cavity. It's like the esophagus or like the, uh, like the vagina or like the urethra. It's closed most of the times because it's a physical barrier. If it's closed, the bacteria cannot go in. But sometimes it opens to equalize the pressure. And when it opens, bacteria goes in. And then you have here at the eustachian tube mucosa or this region, the protympanic mucosa also, lymphatic tissue that is specific to this region. It's called TOT tube associated lymphatic tissue. You don't have these lymphatic tissues anywhere else in the human body. But even if the bacteria goes here, sometimes in the promontory, you have also defense. But as the bacteria goes to the mastoid, as we progress from the station tube to the mastoid, we are losing the defense capability of our mucosa, but we are increasing the respiratory capability of, of our mucosa. So the mucosa of the mastoid has a, a very little defense, but a high power of, of gas exchange. The mucosa of the protympanum, very high power of defense, very low power of gas exchange. And gas exchange is very important because if you have a production, a production of gas, you can equalize a little bit the pressure. In a normal ear, you have always a negative pressure in the middle ear because the mastoid doesn't produce enough gas to equalize completely the system. And why is that? Because if the mastoid produced a lot of gas, the tympanic membrane could explode sometimes. So it always produces le less gas. It's always a negative pressure because the tympanic membrane can be very threatened and, con and conduct the sound in the best way possible. But when the pressure is too low, there is a signal here by the tensor tympani uh, tendon here. And then this signal signals the geniculate ganglia 
that signals the, the, the great petrosal superficial nerve that goes all the way to the great petrosal profundo nerve that goes all the way to the median nerves and, and the nerves that we have here in the, in the, in the face, anterior to the face, in the nasal cavity. And then it signals us to open our mouth because when we open our mouth like this, we are opening the eustachian tube and then we equalize the pressure. So the eustachian tube is more like a buffer to equalize the pressure when the pressure is too low. The problem is when you don't have a eustachian tube that works very well, for, for instance, in patients with a cleft palate, for patients with Down syndrome, for patients with chronic uh, allergic rhinitis, for patients with uh, uh, reflux, uh, patients with a sinus disease, and then this eustachian tube doesn't work very well, you have a negative pressure in the mastoid, this negative pressure doesn't have any way to equalize, and then you can have three things. You can have a complete retraction, you can have a parse flaccid retraction, which is the most prone uh, part to reflect, to retract in the tympanic member, or you can have a perforation. When you have a perforation, I call the finger of God, you have a, 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 a tube that equalizes the pressure from the external auditory canal to the middle ear. But what's the problem with the perforation? Bacteria from the external auditory canal can go into, into the middle ear, and then it can colonize the mastoid, and as, as the mastoid antrum doesn't have defense, you can have a chronic otitis media. Or you can have a retraction in the pars flaccida and skin starts to migrate in and this retraction is not a self-cleaning retraction. And then you can have a retraction pocket cholesteatoma. Or you can have a total retraction, total adhes uh, chronic adhesive otitis media, which is worse. Uh, and then when we talk about retractions or cholesteatoma, the first word that comes into our heads or when we talk about chronic otitis media is mastoidectomy, isn't it? But it is not a mastoid problem. It's not a mastoid disease. It's a middle ear disease. And if you correct the middle ear, if you correct the ventilation roots, if you correct these uh, uh, folds or these ventilation things, maybe you don't need to open the mastoid and to destroy an organism, to destroy an organ that is going to work in the post-operative period to help you. The mastoid is going to produce gas again to help you, to help your surgery. So this is very interesting to understand. So this is the anatomy once again. The cochlear form process is in the middle of, the, of our dissection here. And then you have the geniculate ganglia here, the tympanic segment of facial nerve, the second genial here, the mastoid segment of the facial nerve. Look, this is the facial recess. With, uh, when we talk about endoscopic ear surgery, it's not a recess anymore. It's rather like a valley. And it's very important because sometimes you need to do a posterior tympanotomy as a matter of fact, the posterior tympanotomy was created to inspect the facial recess and the sinus tympani. It was not created for cochlear implantation. But uh, sometimes you need, when we do only microscopic ear surgery, you need to do a posterior tympanotomy just to, to look at the facial recess or the sinus tympani. But when we talk about endoscopic ear surgery, you just raise a tympanomyato flap and you're there at the facial recess or at the sinus tympani. And where's the sinus tympani? Here. The sinus tympani is between the ponticulus and the subiculum. Here's the sinus tympani. The ponticulus is a bony crest sometimes that you have from the posterior pillar to the suprapyramidal uh, space here. And the subiculum is from the posterior pillar to the uh, steloid preeminence, which is here. So you have ponticulus, subiculum, and then you have funiculus from the anterior pillar to the jugular bulb. The funiculus fin is the end, the end of this, uh, the retrotympanic spaces. So you have ponticulus, which, is, which means breach, in Latin, subiculum, which means middle, and then funiculus, which means end. So the bridge, the middle, and the end. Between the bridge and the middle, you have sinus tympani. And between the middle and the end, you have sinus subtympanicum. And this is very important because sometimes you can have a canalicula here, a canal uh, from the subiculum to, to the funiculus, a canal that goes all the way to the petrous apex, which is pneumatizing sometimes. And if you have like a holotympanic cholestatoma or a mesotympanic or a hypotympanic cholestatoma, you have to inspect this canal, otherwise you're sepultating a, a cholesteatoma into the petrous apex. So this is very important for us to try to understand. So sinus tympani, sinus subtympanicum, and here is the posterior sinus. The posterior sinus is very important because it's not posterior, it's anterior as a, as a matter of fact. But when it was described, it was described by Dr. House, he described it through a posterior tympanotomy. So if you think about the posterior tympanotomy, it's here in this region here. So sinus tympani is here and posterior to sinus tympani, when we look about the, uh, with the posterior tympanotomy, we would see the posterior sinus. 
Jacob Saint Nerve here, lateral canal, and then you have here um, the cog. The cog is the center of gravity of the temporal bone, and the cog sometimes divides the anterior tympanic space from the posterior tympanic space, but sometimes it can divide the anterior tympanic space from the supratubal recess. And the supratubal recess has a more smooth mucosa, more defensive mucosa. As we go into the mastoid, you have a more. Uh, 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 so um, we have the anatomy, which is the most beautiful thing that uh, I, I, I see in the middle ear, this endoscopic middle ear anatomy. I, I like it very much. But as I told you, we have the principles. And the principles of the ventilations and the principle of the tympanic uh, diaphragm, which is very important. It's not new, it's not from endoscopic ear surgery. We have seen the uh, tympanic diaphragm since the times of the microscope, since the times of Tarano Paolo, uh, Dr. Hamsik. But with the microscope, this is more difficult for us to see and to understand when we talk about uh, endoscopic ear surgery. With the endoscope, you see the isthmus, the tympanic isthmus, and you see the folds, you see everything. With the microscope, sometimes it's very difficult to see this, especially in the middle ear. And we can see the blockages. In the, that we have in the, in the tympanic isthmus or that we have in the posterior part. So this is very interesting. And one of the most important concepts that I, I, I want to give to you is the concept of the tympanic isthmus. And what is the tympanic isthmus? The tympanic isthmus is an anatomical compartment, ventilation compartment, the most important ventilation route that we have between the station to middle ear and mastoid, which is between the cochlear form process, which is here, and the incoducipedial joint. So this is the tympanic isthmus. You can have the anterior isthmus that ventilates into the Prusak space, and you can, you can have the posterior isthmus that ventilates into the mastoid antrum and the mastoid region. So this is very, very important. And this is a view. It's very nice because you can put the endoscope at the station tube. It's a very different view. It's a, from, the, from the sinus to the mastoid. So can you do a cochlear implantation through the nose? Yes, you can. It's not smart, but uh, you can reach the middle ear through the nose. Uh, following the eustachian tube, of course. And we can see here, this is a left uh, middle ear. The endoscope is from the right uh, si maxillary sinus uh, through a caudal look approach. And then straight, we go to the left middle ear. And then we can see the malleus here, the incoducipedial joint here. And this is the tympanic isthmus. And look at the sides of the tympanic isthmus. It's very small. So a uh, small edema here can block. Or if you have like a retraction here, you can have a blockage. Or if you have a scar tissue from an acute otitis media in the past, you can have a blockage. Or you can have a partial blockage, and this can create different pressures. And then you can have perforations, you can have retractions, you can have different types of things when we talk about inflammatory conditions. But also you can have, uh, um, uh, I would say, embryological problems. Sometimes you have the tensor fold. As a matter of fact, the tensor fold is present in most of people. It's like an embryological thing that you, you are born with it. And the tensor fold blocks this anterior ventilation route. So when you have a blockage, a tensor fold blockage, you only have the tympanic isthmus and the posterior isthmus to be the ventilation routes to the Prusak space, to the mastoid, to mastoid antrum, mastoid tip, everything. So during surgery, sometimes we open, if the tensor fold is closed, we open the tensor fold to create a third route, a third ventilation route to, uh, from the middle ear to the mastoid. So again, this is uh, the video that shows uh, going to the, from the right maxillary sinus all the way to the, um, to the middle ear. So we can go inside and see the middle ear. The malleus here, the incus, the stapes, the promontory here and the tympanic isthmus in this region here. And this is very nice because uh, friends of mine, they, they did a very nice scientific paper that was published on, on laryngoscope in 2016 uh, on this tympanic isthmus thing. So they wanted to ask, the, to answer the question, like if you have a chronic otitis media, if you have a history of ear problems, is your isthmus smaller than a, a isthmus of a person that doesn't have history of your problems? So they answered very smartly with a, a paper that uh, a cadaver study that they did. Uh, the answer is, is yes. If you have a chronic ear problems, uh, most of the times your isthmus is smaller. So you have a lot of scar tissue, a lot of fibrotic tissue or blockages or 
things blocking the ventilation route when compared to a normal year, a, a year without a history of ear problems. So the tympanic isthmus, I like to say, I, I do sinus surgery also, is the osteomental complex of the ear. So if you understand the tympanic isthmus, you understand a lot of the disease of the middle ear, including the cholesterol, of course. But of course, there are cholecytomas that go into the mastoid, so you need to open the mastoid to remove the cholecytoma from the mastoid. You, you have to give to Caesar what, is, what belongs to Caesar. Eh? It's a saying. But what about the future? Uh, the, the dissection that we did all over this like 20 years gave us uh, different types of approaches or possibilities or capabilities to develop, first of all, instruments for endoscopic surgery. I always say, that if you want to do like an endoscopic tympanoplasty, the, the basic tray that you have in a hospital is essential, is enough to perform the surgery. But if you want to do cholecytoma surgery, you have to have special instruments. It's like uh, you cannot do a frontal sinus surgery with a septoplasty tray or septoplasty instruments. You have to have frontal sinus instruments. To do cholecytoma, you have to have cholecytoma instruments. And this is very important because one of the most uh, things, frustrating things for the surgeons, I think, is when they want to do endoscopic ear surgery and when they don't have the instruments, they want to do the same things that they already do with the microscope at their first endoscopic surgery. This cannot be done. This is impossible to be done. So it's easy for you to get frustrated and then to say that endoscopic ear surgery is not good. But the problem is sometimes you don't have the instruments or you don't have the skills because endoscopic ear surgery, the learning curve is different from microscopic ear surgery. So uh, the courses, of course, nowadays with the coronavirus pandemic, uh, the hands-on courses, they are almost canceled. But uh, when they are, they are back, the courses are very important things for you to try to develop this eye-hand coordination. We have courses in, in, in the UK. So it's very, very interesting to understand. Also, to have a good equipment, to have a good uh, camera, camera system, a good endoscopic system, a good uh, 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 room set up to understand to put the trays in order for you to pick up the instruments or the anesthesiology card in uh, certain regions. And I like to operate standing. I operate standing because it's easier for me yeah, to operate standing. And also, also the, 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 the angulation is different. When you are standing, sometimes it's easier for you to reach the retrotympanic areas. When you sit, sometimes you have to angulate more your hand to go back, to sit back. When you sit, of course, you can see better the protympanic space, but the retrotympanic areas you cannot see in a very uh, easy way. Uh, so if, because I stand, I also position my patient like in a fast position. I elevate the, the, the dorsum and hyperstand the head in order to, to have less uh, bleeding because this helps into the bleeding. You have to remember with endoscopic ear surgery, you have one hand, the other hand is holding the endoscope. Of course, you have trip, tips and tricks in order to try to, to avoid bleeding, a lot of bleeding uh, into the surgery, but this helps, this is one of the tips and one of the tricks that helps uh, 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 diminishing the bleeding. One important thing, this is Dr. Panetti from Italy and Dr. Huang from Taiwan. One important thing is always have the monitor at your eyesight. If you have a high monitor and you cannot put the monitor down, it's not good for you to sit because otherwise you do the surgery like this and then you have at the end of the surgery, like a one hour surgery, you are with a, a terrible uh, uh, neck pain. So this is a very important thing to try to understand. So. I told you, when you sit, you have more freedom uh, in some angles, but you have less freedom in other angles, and you have less uh, uh, visualiz visualization of the retrotympanic spaces if you sit. If you stand, you have better visualization of the retrotympanic space. But there are now different types of instruments, like burrs, protective burrs, that you can have, or curved burrs from different types of companies that you can have in order to help this one hand task that you have, which, which is endoscopic ear surgery to try. Uh, the Japanese, uh, Seiji Kakehata, my friend from Japan, always uh, uses the ultrasonic aspirator in order to remove bone. My Italian friends, they use uh, the piezo device to remove bone. This is in, in interesting instruments, of course, uh, that you can use also. Uh, 
there are some some instruments that uh, people try to use, like the endo scrub, to uh, to clean the endoscope without removing the endoscope. I, I like to remove the endoscope when the endoscope is not is not clean because when you remove the endoscope, you are cooling down the the, the, the surgical field. Because even if you use a LED light source, there are heat. Uh, there is heat uh, being transmitted into the middle ear and into the mastoid. So it's very important for you to remove sometimes the endoscope or to put the suction uh, with the endoscope because it cools down uh, the environment and doesn't uh, 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 fry the corda, for instance, or doesn't cook the, the malleus or the stapes because it can be very high, uh, very hot when we talk about uh, endoscopic air surgery. And the cost, when we compare the cost between microscopic ear surgery and endoscopic ear surgery, I'm telling the pure things. Of course, most of the times you do combine approach, but when you compare just like a microscopic tympanoplasty to an endoscopic tympanoplasty, the endoscopic tympanoplasty sometimes is more cheap for the system uh, and for everything, for everyone, uh, when compared to the microscopic, especially in, in countries like Brazil, poor countries like Brazil, uh, we don't have access to very high-end good uh, microscopes because they are very expensive, especially in the public hospitals. In the private hospitals, yes, you have the best microscopes, but in the public hospitals, sometimes you don't. But the endoscopic system is cheaper than a good microscopic system. So sometimes uh, this is very, very useful for us to understand this. There are holders that uh, people can use. This is Dr. Mubarak Khan from India. He developed a, a, an interesting holder. I don't like the idea of using a holder because I, I want to have this dynamic view in order for my, my brain to develop like a 3D visualization. Because when we move the endoscope, we can uh, formulate some uh, stereoscopic view. And of course, the 3D endoscopes. Uh, I, I've used the 3D endoscope. It's very, it's interesting. It's cool, but uh, of course, this is it, it's it's a plus in a thing that is already settled with uh, the technique that we already do in a very good way. So um, this is an example of a 3D endoscope. The cameras nowadays we have uh, in different types of filters of the cameras. Like this is from stores. You have the the Clara, the Chroma, the Chroma Key, uh, the Spectrum A, Spectrum B, and these filters can be used. There are some people working on it. Can be used to for you to identify cholesteatoma, for instance. So at the end of the surgery, you pass the endoscope with a polarized filter, and then you know if you are leaving cholesteatoma in some places that you can see with the endoscope. So this is very interesting, also, and a very important thing in order to to understand the disease. Another example of the 3D endoscope and the cameras, and I'm not going to talk about the camera. This is the use of a filter, the narrow band imaging and 4K technology in order to try to see the cholesteatoma if there is cholesteatoma, remain residual cholesteatoma uh, at the end of the surgery. So this is a very interesting paper. Uh, image guidance system that is already used in the sinus cavity you can uh, also try to use uh, also in the in the ear, in the middle ear, or especially in the in the in the in the lateral skull base. Well, of course, uh, I always say to residents here, it, it doesn't matter. You can have the best image, best possible image garden system. If you don't know the anatomy, it's not good. So uh, for lateral skull base, we can have the combined approach, the retrosigmal approach, microscopic with the endoscope at the end, or to see the, the fundus of the internal auditory canal without the need of drilling a lot, uh, the superior part of the internal auditory canal and without uh, having the risk of opening some mastoid air cells and to have like a CSF leak to the mastoid. So you can see the fundus of the internal auditory canal. And you can also see if there is tumor at the fundus and work and, and with endoscopes to try to remove this tumor from the fundus of the internal auditory canal. The anatomy of the inner ear and the approaches that you can have, transcanal approaches to the, to, the, uh, to the inner ear are very interesting. You have the supragenicular approach, you have the transpromontary approach, you have the infracochlear uh, approach or infrapromontary approach. So th these are, uh, windows that open, that expand the possibilities and the capabilities of the use of the endoscope for lateral skull base uh, with also, of course, the, the traditional microscopic approaches that you can have uh, to do this. Um, you can see also complications of cochlear implantation. See, sometimes you put the electrode in the wrong direction here. 
Sometimes you put down the oval window is uh, in this position here, but it puts in the the infracochlear canaliculus. So sometimes it can go also to the jugular and the carotid. So it's very important for us to understand this. Uh, endoscopic cochlear implantation, which is very nice. Uh, and uh, let me see what's that. And I think that's it. I, I, it's 40 minutes, the lecture. I, I talked about the principles, the physiology, some of the anatomy, and some of the future glances that we have. I didn't talk about the robotic because uh, it's, it's too early to talk about robotic. But I think it's a whole new world, uh, which is uh, uncurtained in our, in our fronts. And of course, most of the times you have to do what is best, not for you, but for your patient. If you have a small cholesterol or if you have a perforation, for me, it's, you, you cannot do a retroarticular approach. Uh, you're going to make the patient to suffer more uh, if, you, if you do endoscopic air surgery, it's, it's better. So the, the idea is to understand endoscopic air surgery, microscopic air surgery, and to merge the two words, uh, worlds in order to, to give for the patients the best care possible. And uh, I think that was it, the lecture. Thank you very much for your time. Sorry about the interruption of my, my son. And these are some books that we have uh, on endoscopic air surgery. This is, uh, I like to say, it's a, the Bible, the Quran, or the Torah of, uh, of endoscopic air surgery, of ear surgery, because you have all the way from embryology to inner ear surgery from my friends from Italy, Marchioni and Prezzuti. And I think that's it. This is a, a last phrase that I always like to end the, the lectures. It's by Dr. Philip Littlefield. He is from America. And he said, endoscopic ear surgery has a lot of advantages, but don't confuse it as being easy. As a matter of fact, endoscopic ear surgery is more difficult than microscopic ear surgery. But if you m manage to, to master it, I'm sure you have a lot of benefits and a lot of patients will be grateful to you. So thank you very much for your time. And, uh, I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Uh, the first question that we've got is uh, asking, do you have any experience in endoscopic air surgery in children? This is a very, very interesting question. Very good question. If I have experience in children with endoscopic air surgery, yes. And uh, in children, you have uh, different things. The canal is usually uh, narrower, but it's usually smaller. So. Nowadays, we use a three millimeter endoscope and for three millimeter diameter and 14 centimeters length endoscope. Uh, this endoscope is very good. I also use for sinus surgery. And uh, this, uh, the canal of the children is, is, is smaller. So it's easier for you to reach the, the, the tympanic membrane because it's smaller. You don't have a lot of, of thing of tissue. But in children, uh, it's different. The types of, of disease in children sometimes are different. The cholestatoma, most of the times, is congenital cholestatoma, holotympanic cholestatoma. So it's, it's different. You have uh, some considerations that you have that you, you must have in children that you don't have sometimes in adults. But the technical things are not different. So for me, sometimes it's easy to operate a child than to operate an adult with a very big ear canal, but a tortuous one, because it's, it's going to be longer. So uh, the children are, are very interesting candidates for endoscopic ear surgery. Thank you. Uh, so the next question we've got is, uh, how do you prepare your ear canal? Uh, this is very good. Uh, the, the preparation of the ear canal is very important because most of the bleeding that you can have and uh, the most frustrating part of the surgery that you can have, which is the bleeding, is uh, at the beginning of the surgery when you are raising the tympanomatal flap. So I, before I start the surgery, I always put cottonoids, adrenaline-soaked cottonoids, pure adrenaline-soaked cottonoids at the middle ear skin, at, at the external auditory canal skin. Uh, I thought it wouldn't, wouldn't absorb, but it, it, it does. So the skin gets very white. <laughs> and then, uh, of course, I, I wait a little bit. I put the cottonoids and then I trim the hair. It takes like one minute, two minutes with it. And I usually do not infiltrate, but some people infiltrate with... Uh, uh, anesthetic solutions with adrenaline. And this can also help a lot uh, diminishing the, the bleeding. Of course, there are a lot of, of, of factors to, to try to avoid bleeding. Anesthesia is one of them. If you have like a TIV anesthesia, and when you compare to gas anesthesia to several end, the TIV anesthesia can induce less bleeding than the gas anesthesia. 
if you operate like here in sea level, and then if you operate in the mountains, you can have more bleeding at the mountains. It's because of the pressure. So it's, it's a, a multifactory thing. But if you prepare your ear canal with cotonoids and sometimes infiltration, you can avoid uh, unnecessary bleeding, I would say like this. But you ha also have to have sharp instruments to do one cut and not to pass the instrument like several times. And uh, uh, of course, a, a good position of the patient. And when you elevate in the flap, you put in cottonoids, adrenaline, so cottonoids also to uh, avoid this bleeding. This is very important. So to prepare, objectively, the answer to prepare is infiltration and then adrenaline, so cottonoids. Uh, so the next question uh, from one of my colleagues here in the UK uh, is, do you routinely request uh, diffusion-weighted MRIs preoperatively in patients to determine the extent of disease, guiding whether you can do a total endoscopic approach? This is a very good question, and the answer here is no, uh, for several reasons. The, first of all, because it's not too easy to get an MRI, especially in the public service here. And second, because it's very expensive in the private uh, section here of the, the medicine here. If I, if I had a very uh, easy available MRI, I would. I would because it would help, especially to know the size of the cholesteatoma in order to prepare. But talking about cholesteatoma, we always start the surgery at the middle east, always. It doesn't matter if the cholesteatoma is small or of if the cholesteatoma is big. If the cholesterol is small, okay, we, we just do transcanal and remove the cholesterol, inspect the sinus tympan and facial recess, okay, clean the mastoid uh, with the fluid sometimes that, that they are in the mastoid because of the blockage, and that's okay. But if, it is, if the cholesterol is big and goes into the mastoid, we clean the middle ear first, which is the most important area when we talk about residual disease or recurrent disease, sinus tympan and facial recess, the protein spaces, and then we clean, and then we do a combined approach, do a retroricular uh, incision, small mastoidectomy, and then remove the cholesterol from the antrum. If the, if the cholesterol goes all the way to the tip, we go all the way to the, we, we follow the disease, understand? And doing this, first of all, we can preserve sometimes the mastoid because not every cholesterol is going to be inside the mastoid. And if we start the surgery in the middle ear, we will preserve the mastoid in these cases. And second of all, even if we need to open the mastoid, we don't need to saucerize the mastoid to do like a temporal bone course in the mastoid. We only open the mastoid following the disease. And then we preserve some mastoid air cells. And these air cells are going to produce gas that are going to help in the post-operative uh, uh, period, uh, equalizing, try to uh, gas exchange to try to equalize the pressure. So uh, uh, I think this is the, the answer. Um, I think this sort of takes us into our next question. That what is your limit? When would you decide to bring in the microscope um, in addition to the endoscope? Yeah, this is the most important question, I would say. A very important question. Uh, at the beginning, we, we are trying like, to prove ourselves and to say, ah, there's no limit. You can do everything with the endoscope. Blah, blah. This is not true. Uh, yes, you, you can remove a cholestatoma from the mastoid tip using the transcanal route, but it's not smart. Because you have to, you will lose a lot of time doing inside out mastoidectomy, and then you need to reconstruct at the end with the cartilage. It's not smart. So, my limit is two answers. First of all, it will depend on the matrix of the cholesterol. Sometimes you have infiltrate, most of the times actually, you have infiltrative matrix cholesterol. When you have this type of cholesterol, the, the, the disease infiltrates the bone, it, it stays like a gum. It, it sneaks into the bone. And then it doesn't have a clivage plane, a very good clivage plane that you can completely remove the sac from the bone and from the mucosa. So even if you have a small cholestatoma with uh, an infiltrative matrix cholestatoma, sometimes I do combine approach because I want to see the medial part of the scutum. The medial part of the scutum you cannot see with the endoscope, it's blind. It's impossible to see in a transcanal way. So if I think there are infiltrative matrix cholestatoma, even in small one, at the medial part of the scutum, I have to do a combined approach. But on the other hand, if I have a non-infiltrative matrix cholestatoma, which is the, not the most common type of cholestatoma, especially here in Brazil, um, sometimes you can remove completely the cholestatoma transcanal, even if it's a big cholestatoma, because it has a cleavage plane, and sometimes you can wash water, wash saline solution into the mastoid, and the, the cholestatoma will pop out like a, like a polyp, and then you remove. 
So the, the, the first answer is the matrix of the cholestatoma. And then the second answer is wh whenever I have doubt. So if I have doubt that I didn't remove completely the cholestatoma, and if the cholestatoma extends beyond the limit of the lateral canal, I do a combined approach. If I don't have doubt, if I think I've removed completely the cholestatoma, and then I don't need to do a combined approach. Uh, the next question uh, one of our colleagues has asked is, uh, could, would you be able to recommend uh, certain endoscopic instruments and could you share some of the pictures of the instruments that you use regularly? Uh, this is a very good question also. Let me see here. First of all, you need to have a good endoscope and a good camera. This is, <laughs> this is important uh, thing to have good endoscope and a good camera. Second of all, you don't need... Uh, there are some sets that are uh, commercially available, like the Storz or Medtronic or uh, Spigoni TTs, a lot of instruments. I will share my screen again here. For a cholestatoma, you need like uh, five, six instruments. Of course, you need, uh, if you say that I said this, I deny. You have to bend some instruments also, and then you bend some, some, some suction, some suction tips. But Regarding the suction tips, the instruments that I like very much to use is a very good curette, a very good curette, sharp curette. The Thomasan, the Thomasan we call the hockey stick. The Thomasan is like, a, it's this one here. It's a very nice instrument. And then the biggest Thomasan here, which is this one. And then some, some hooks, 90 degree, 45 degree hooks and curved instruments. And of course, curved suction. This is very important. Curved suction, you, you can bend the tip of the section, but uh, of course, uh, I didn't tell you to do this, but uh, if you have like three or four burnt sections and these instruments like this, you, you can do a lot of things with endoscopic surgery using uh, for cholestatoma, for instance. Uh, 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 next question is, uh, is asking about your views on primary mastoid obliteration that some people say reduces the volume of middle ear mastoid uh, needing yeah. ventilation and reduces recurrence. Yeah, it, this is completely true. And, and if you think about physiology, it completely works. It, it's a very clever way to, to deal with things. If you don't have a, a, a big mastoid, a functioning mastoid, of course, you can obliterate the mastoid. But when you obliterate the mastoid, you have to think one thing. If you have a middle ear space, if you create a small middle ear space, this middle ear space has to be ventilated. The mastoid is not going to ventilate anymore because you obliterate it. So the eustachian tube is going to be the most important thing. And then if you have a functioning eustachian tube, this obliteration will work very, very well. But the, if the eustachian tube doesn't work for many, many reasons, uh, allergic, uh, allergic rhinitis, sinusitis, reflux, adenoids, whatever reason, a tumor, whatever reason you, you, you might imagine, this obliteration is not going to work, not because of the obliteration, but because of the eustachian tube. So the eustachian tube is like the missing link that we have between the ear and the sinus. And it's very important, very important, but honestly, we don't know what to do with the eustachian tube. There are balloons, laser, whatever, but it's, it's the thing. We know the anatomy, but we don't know what to do. I always like to, to pick up the patient in this combined approach. Most of the ear patients, they have sinus problems. Most of the ear patients. So whenever you do ear surgery, sometimes if you do sinus surgery, sometimes you need to do sinus surgery in that patient to reduce the turbinates, whatever. Or you have to recommend that, that patient to a rhinologist to do this combined approach. Because if you only treat the co ear compartment and you forget the nose, the patient ha might have a nasal problem, a sinus problem, and then you can do the best ear surgery possible. But if the patient doesn't fix their uh, allergic problems or their sinus problems or their nasal turbinate problems, whatever, the patient will have problems again in the ear. So this is very important. Uh, I think uh, following up on that, I think there's a question that talks about uh, whether you perform eustachian tube balloon dilatation in cases with uh, middle ear surgery, that middle ear disease that you feel is secondary to eustachian tube dysfunction. Yes, I have done uh, some uh, eustachian tube dilatations with a balloon with some companies, the Claret balloon, the Spigo and Tease balloon, and my results are mixed. You mean, you know, uh, there are patients that are completely fine with the first uh, uh, balloon dilatation that you do. 
and then they will never have problems. But of course, you have to treat the patients with steroids in the nasal cavity, ta, 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 because sometimes they are patients with uh, sinusitis or rhinitis, whatever. But uh, sometimes you have patients that you do one dilatation and then six months later, you have to do another dilatation again. And then six months later, you have to perform dilatations, uh, uh, several dilatations. And the balloon system here, it's not very uh, cheap. It's very expensive actually. And uh, most of the patients cannot afford. So I would say half and half, 50% of my patients, they are very good with the balloon and 50% they don't. They don't work very well. And I guess it's also a really complex thing to note because we overall don't know much about how, what factors would affect uh, patients with eustachian tube dysfunction and their improvement with balloon dilatation as well, isn't it? Yeah, because you have a, it's a multifactory disease, the eustachian tube. Even reflux can create eustachian tube problems. And sometimes we are too focused in a thing and we forget the patient is a holo, holistic patient. And then we don't treat the reflux or we don't treat whatever disease is it's pro probably causing the dysfunction of the eustachian tube. Um, someone has asked about whether you do balloon dilatation in children. No, I've, ne I've never done in children. My youngest patient that I did dilatation had 16 years old. 16. I've never done in children. Okay. Uh, there are a few questions not particularly about endoscopic ASG, but I'll go through them as well. Uh, what material would you use for mustard obliteration when you do obliteration? Well, it depends. It depends on, on the patient. If the patient has a lot of bone that you can, bone dust that you can uh, harvest from the field, from the surgical field, you can put a lot of bone dust. Sometimes you can rotate a, a flap, a muscle, and it depends on, on the patient. It's, it's not a, a cake recipe, I'll say like this. Perfect. Uh, thank you so much for answering all our questions and uh, for talking a little bit about endoscopic ear surgery, which I think is it's truly one of the tools in the arsenal that we have as ear surgeons.